by Monday, June 8th for discarding old voters' ID as an identification for registration onto the new voters' register. And on the international news, Brazil sets record of 1,349 for daily coronavirus deaths on Wednesday. This is your Election Command Centre. Now, the Supreme Court has ordered the Electoral Commission to file legal basis by Monday, June 8, for discarding the old voters' ID as an identification for the registration of potential voters onto the new voters' register. This was after the plaintiff, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, opened its defence in a case between it's the party and the Electoral Commission, as well as the Attorney General. In the order, the court told the plaintiff it's free to file a legal argument after the second defendant, the Electoral Commission, files its legal basis. The NDC sued the Electoral Commission over its decision to compile a fresh voters' register. The NDC is seeking, among others, a declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 45A of the 1992 Constitution, the second defendant has the constitutional power to and can compile a register of voters only once and thereafter revise it periodically as may be determined by law. The NDC has insisted that there is no need to compile a new voter's role, but the Commission is insisting also to go ahead with the registration. According to the Electoral Commission, the current voters register and its management system and biometric verification devices cannot deliver a credible election. And still on this uh, development, the NDC is raising concerns over the Electoral Commission's decision to compile a voters' register without a population and housing census. Member of the party's legal and communications team, lawyer Eduji Tamaklo, told Johnny Hughes on TV3's uh, New Day Thursday morning that the Ghana Statistical Service has been denied the funds to carry out the needed exercise. Look, for the first time, we are having to compile a new register without the benefit of what you call population census. So question, what numbers are informing Jane Mensah even in the printing of registration materials? Because you need a population census. Mm. It is the population census that will give you an indication of the registrable population, mm. persons 18 years and above. So that when you are printing the registration material, that is what will inform you too. When you are doing the distribution of registration material, because you know, 18 and above in Volta region, they are 1.2 million. Mm. 18 and above in Ashanti region, they are 4 million. 18 and above in Nord uh, Northern region, and so, so and so. So when you are doing the distribution of registration material, you are informed by data. Mr. Akufuado is not interested. Sorry, <laughs> is not interested mm. in the population census. No, but please. Government has done everything to frustrate the Ghana Statistical Service from going ahead with, you know, the population and housing census. When you say everything, what do you mean? Look, money. I have heard the PRO that the amount they put before government that they needed to start the population and housing census was not given. They gave them half of it. And so a government that is not interested mm. in having a credible population and housing census so that tomorrow leading government officials cannot go on Facebook and say, K2 South, you have this number of population and why do you have this registrable population? Let's do the housing and population census. That is what will become the feed mm. into compiling a national register of voters.
Um, to other stories right here on Midday Live, the Shia community in Tamale is ready to observe the Juma prayers on Friday after some months of closure. This follows the easing of restrictions on religious activities in the country by President Kufuado in his 10th address on COVID-19. Sheikh uh, Dalo Abdul Mumin is the leader of uh, in the northern region. To our congregation, they are aware we will be praying on Friday. Coming this Friday, we will start praying. We actually pray, and we are to abide and we agree to abide by the restrictions. It is in our own interest. We should understand that it is in our own interest that we abide by those. It's not in a maybe a, a kind of orders from above, it is in line with the natural instincts of every sensible human being. Amen. If disease is to get in of us, yes, it affects the, 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 the whole country, the government will be worried, but we will be more affected than any person because directly we will be affected. So the, restrict, uh, the, 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 the guidelines, we agree to abide by the guidelines. We already have our, our, our containers for the uh, water and the soap ready. We have the sanitizers. We'll put all those things in, in, in place. On, and in the masjid also, in the mosque, who we'll have our uh, uh, marks covering the, the mouth and nose. The war is still going on. I mean, we are only realizing some, I mean, some uh, slides. We don't see the, the, the attack as we were anticipating. So we feel we are relaxing a bit. But that doesn't mean that the situation is totally eradicated. That's uh, Sheikh Abdul Dalo uh, Mumin there. Let's uh, quickly cross over to Skype. Christopher Mwako, our Northern Regional Correspondent, is joining us uh, with some updates. Uh, that, so, uh, Christopher, thanks very much. Uh, so, I want to find out from you uh, the preparations ongoing for Friday's uh, Juma. You can give us a narrative because we are hearing that the share community is ready. How prepared are they? Yes, uh, I must say that the Shia community in the, uh, the Tamale metropolis are very much uh, prepared because I visited the mosque uh, yesterday and today. As we speak now, cleaning is currently ongoing at the mosque. Uh, the Zoom lion also passed by to disinfect uh, the environment ahead of tomorrow's uh, Juma prayer. So uh, as we speak, as for the Shia community, they are uh, more than prepared ahead of tomorrow, mm -hmm. 5th June, to observe the uh, Juma prayers. So, so we just heard from uh, Sheikh Mumin a while ago about the sanitizers being ready, etc., etc. And your interaction with the Shia community and the Muslims, uh, do you get a sense that the individuals who might need to turn up for Friday's Juma are themselves conscious and aware of what to do, how to protect themselves, how to protect other people as they congregate? Yes, uh, the, the, the situation uh, about the people has to do with uh, discipline. And uh, passing through the Tamale metropolis, you can see that a lot of them uh, wear the face masks, which is one. And so talk about social distancing. The reason why the Shia community will be praying tomorrow is that their numbers are not that great, as greater as the Ahmadis and the uh, uh, al Sunnis. Uh, their number is not that great. So for them, social distancing, they can observe and the wearing of nose masks. As for the washing of hands with soap and uh, under running water, uh, the uh, mocks have been provided with enough of the Veronica buckets. Uh, I cited about five uh, uh, Veronica buckets mm. around, uh, which will be used uh, tomorrow by the people who come to pray. Right. So, so when you talk about mosques, I know you've just told us that their numbers are not as uh, large as the Ahmadis and the other sects, uh, Islamic sects in the uh, northern region. But how many mosques are we talking about? I mean, uh, five, three, ten. And how prepared are these ones? Because I asked you my earlier question, how prepared they are. But the individual mosques, are they are they ready? Yes, as for the Ahmadis and uh, uh, Al Sunnah, you remember there is a release from the Ahmadiyya uh, uh, mission mm -hmm. in Ghana that they are not ready to uh, start the prayers uh, uh, right. tomorrow. But the Al Sunnah in Tamale also, uh, they've, they've not communicated officially, but the information I am gathering is that they are not also 
uh, observing the uh, Duma prayers starting tomorrow. But other mosques around town, uh, the ones around uh, Peeling Point in Tamale and other areas, uh, I have picked information that they will be praying tomorrow. So we'll be following up on this uh, tomorrow to right. see whether they are actually going to uh, observe the Juma prayers. Right. Uh, Christopher, thanks very much uh, for that uh, quick update. Uh, Christopher Mwako is our uh, man in the northern region, giving us up to date with the uh, Juma prayers for the Shia community in the northern Ooh. region. This is still midday live from our studios at, at De Sawe Kanda. Now, the Teachers and Education Workers Union Tewu has praised government for approving the 15% critical support allowance for its members nationwide. Leadership of the union was reacting to a news conference by the Ministry of Education on the payment of the critical support allowance in Accra. Yes. Has fought for a critical support allowance for its members in the education sector. The critical support, according to the leadership of Tewu, is to motivate its members to give their best. Already, some more than 10,000 of its members are benefiting from the critical support, while others are not. After a meeting with the president, Nane Kufado, and the Minister of Education, the amount will be paid. The 15% critical support allowance is expected to create equity in the salary administration in the education sector. General Secretary of Tewu, Mark Ranchi, was elated about the decision to pay the amount. The security person's work is directly linked to teaching and learning. Uh, the administrator, the typist, and all name them. All those people have direct link to teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. And so we have fought this battle to the point where now our employers, direct employers, that Ghana Education Service, the Minister of Education, the presidency, all see the need for all category of staff in the Ghana Education Service to receive this critical support. Mm -hmm. He emphasized on an upcoming meeting with Ghana Education Service and the Education Ministry to finalize the implementation schedule. We would meet with Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and then go to finance. And once we meet with finance, we are sure that this, this issue will be over and done with. And that, for me, is, is a very good news. And that is why I say that for us in Tewu, all the things that has been announced, uh, this bit of it is, is, is a very good and welcoming news and we would pursue it to the latter. Meanwhile, Tewu has called on government to provide protective equipment before schools reopen for the final year students. Now, new charges have been announced against all the sacked police officers present at the death of African-American George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, the, the death of Floyd has, big, has created a lot of problems, and uh, racial problems and tensions within the U.S. The, 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 the first officer, uh, Chauvin, who was arrested, according to court documents, indicate that the charges have been elevated from third-degree murder to first degree. The other three, however, who were previously uncharged, now face counts of aiding and abetting murder. Floyd's death has sparked huge protests across the United States against racism and police killing of black Americans. The vast majority of demonstrations over the past eight days have been peaceful, but some have turned violent and curfews have been imposed posed in a number of cities in the U.S. And ex-U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary uh, James Matisse has denounced President Donald Trump, saying he deliberately stokes division. He said he was angry and appalled by Trump's handling of ongoing protests over the death of African-American George Floyd at the hands of the police. Matisse berated Trump's abuse of authority and backed protesters seeking to uphold American values, as did ex-President Barack Obama. President Trump described Matisse as an overrated general. Uh, general Matisse quit in 2018 after Trump decided to pull uh, U.S. troops out of Syria. He has remained mostly silent since then until his rebuke of the Trump administration was published in the Atlantic magazine on Wednesday.
So uh, let's cross to the United States and speak with Dr. Hayford Insian, who is a public uh, policy analyst and lecturer at the Department of Political Science, Auburn University. Auburn University is in Alabama. Uh, Doc, thanks very much for joining us at such a short notice. I know that uh, your state, your state has uh, a large black population. So I want to find out from you how the latest events and uh, tensions and protests are affecting race relations between black people and white people in the U.S. and in your state in particular? See, uh, thank you for having me, Stephen. You know, there is a great awakening among mm. um, different race in America. You know, people are just tired of the systemic, systemic racial abuse mm. of black people. Now, if, if you look at the protest, the protesters are made up of multiracial group of mostly young Americans fast, fast, fighting for justice. Mm -hmm. You know, justice and freedom um, is a God-given right, irrespective of your race. So people are putting aside their racial differences and coming together, fighting for equality, fighting for the freedom of black people, the way they are being treated when mm. it comes to the um, law enforcement agency. So, um, you know, America is already divided on the line of race. Yeah. But this focusing event mm. has brought the different races together and they are now demanding for justice mm. for black people and, and also um, Latinos. Yeah. It's so, 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 Doc, what I want to find out is that, I mean, we know the, 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 the systemic racial problems of the United States has been there for a while, but with the death of George Floyd, there have been renewed agitation. And there are black people who possibly may be facing uh, subtle forms of racism on the back of these protests. So, has the relationship become any worse or any bad between black and white people following the death of Floyd and the protests that are ongoing? I would say that the death of George Floyd has, like I said earlier on, it's, it's, uh, people are now Awaken. awake. People mm. are now coming to, their, uh, coming to the realization that there is a need for them to come together. So I don't see that much of racial apathy right now. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's, it looks like people are coming together. People are coming together. People so, are mm. realizing that there is a need to come together. So, so as you see it, from the way your readings are, do you think the protests are going to calm down now following the charging of the other officers who previously were not charged? You know, you know Stephen, people have natural right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that is what the protesters are fighting for. Mm. You know, just charging the other police officers, um, it's not just enough. Mm. They, are not, they are not protesting for the other police officers to be charged, but rather they are protesting to demand justice. They are protesting to demand a change when it comes to public policy. Mm. You know, most public policies in terms of social and criminal justice are made, on, are made by the political elite. But now when you look at the uh, protesters, they are fighting for the use of advocacy coalition model mm. where all voices will be heard, concerns will be brought to the table so that the policy will not just favor just a group of people, but will favor all Americans. Mm. So, so let's, let's talk about the political undertones that this has taken. I know that the Democratic candidate, presumptive candidate actually, Joe Biden has visited some protest side, he has made statements, but there are those also who say Joe Biden doesn't exactly have a good record with black people because it was during his regime when he had the opportunity that several laws were put in place leading to the incarceration of black people. These sentiments, are they, are they showing? among black people within uh, the, the U.S. when they hear Joe Biden make comments or statements about this? Yes, yes. But, but you know, this protest or this event has brought about mm. an opportunity of, it's, it's more like an open window mm. for him to build a strong political capital among the electorate by engaging them on issues that matters to the black voters mm. and also demonstrate the importance 
of the black community to the Democratic Party. So for him, this, for me, this route or this demonstration is an opportunity for him to redeem himself, mm. to prove to the black community that in, indeed he is for them. He is ready to bring about policy change, put in place social and criminal mm. justice. And, 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 and Doc, do you, do you think that that's, that's succeeding for him? Is he succeeding? Is he making progress with these moves? Yes, to some extent, because the, uh, and the reason is the approval rating of President Trump, it mm. looks like he's going down. It's going down. So, mm. yeah, so once he's going down, he is taking the opportunity to build himself up, to gain the trust of these um, black voters. And I, I think he's working for him. Mm. And, uh, and also, uh, talking about Donald Trump, I want to find out from you what your assessment of Donald Trump and uh, his management of, of this issue has been. Well, I believe uh, his handling of the issue has the potential to further divide Americans. You know, he, he has proposed dominating the protesters instead of showing solidarity. Now, the use of the National Guard, for me, is uncalled for. Mm. It's uncalled for because people are already hurting. People don't feel safe, so he's supposed to be on their side. Even though he is supposed to condemn the violence, the few bad nuts among the protesters, but the way he's handling it is, is, is bringing him a lot of backlash. And it looks like people are not happy the way he's handling it. It mm -hmm. looks like he, he really doesn't care about what people are going through. All he's concerned about is the violence. Mm. And, and do, you, do you anticipate that this uh, is going to affect the November polls? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know, protest is always, or uh, such events, it's always an opportunity for um, presidential candidate to um, use it to put issues on the agenda mm. to develop mm. new policies uh, for the future. So now this, the way President Trump especially has handled the protest um, gives the Democratic, the Democratic Party an opportunity yeah. to come out with a proposal, a policy proposal to examine and address the issue of race and the way in which politicians treat black voters is definitely going to have an impact on, on the November polls. Now, now you, you are a Ghanaian, I, uh, of, or of Ghanaian origin. I want to find out from you whether you or other Ghanaians you know have taken part in the protest, obviously, if they're black people and they're uh, also legal residents in the United States, they should have a stake. Yes, yes. People from all race are taking part in this demonstration. Mm. You know, this is not just about African Americans. It's about black people. Black people. And brown people, Latinos. Mm. So people are really fighting. People are taking part because today is African American. The next day, it will be immigrants. And most immigrants are blacks. So Ghanaians, uh, Africans, Asians, Southern Americans, fellow North Americans, everybody is, is part of this protest fighting for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is what this protest is about. Right. Uh, Dr. Nsia, we're grateful for your time. I know we'd love to continue, but uh, before you go, a very quick one. I mean, looking at how this is going, uh, how is this going to affect the overall safety of black people when the protest is over? I know protest is not over, but after protest, do you get the sense that black people are going to feel a lot more empowered to step out onto the streets it will be it will be very very difficult for that to happen mm. uh, I, 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 that's what i hope for that's what i hope for but it will be very very difficult because this is not the first time a black person it, has been shot uh, like i said in your in my previous interview with 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 your um, uh, media um, staging when michael brown was killed in uh, missouri I lived just about 10 minutes from Michael Brown. Mm. Protests took place. There were violence. A lot of policy initiatives were undertaken, but it did not really make any change. Impact. So mm. I'm just hoping that this will probably this will bring a do change. Something great. Uh, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Hefron Nsia, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Hefron Nsia is a Ghanaian resident in Alabama. He's uh, a lecturer at Auburn University. I'm Stephen Enti. This is Midday Live from our studios at the Saudi Kanda in Accra. We have more news for you. Please stay.
Welcome to the business segment on Midday Live. Now, some players in the financial sector are projecting the level of savings to drop further because individual incomes have dropped due to numerous job losses recorded owing to the coronavirus pandemic. They, however, remain optimistic. The central bank has put in place strong supervision to ensure individual savings are secured despite a drop in income levels. Uh, Nanakuya Mensa Brampa reports. Following the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, most economies across the globe have witnessed a drop in the savings and investment portfolios due to loss of incomes. For instance, the Chinese retail savings and investment market is forecast to grow by just 3.3% in 2020, its worst performance since the global financial crisis. Layoffs and job losses induced by partial lockdowns and COVID-related restrictions since mid-March 2020 raises the prospects of a further slowdown in consumer spending. Analysis of the monetary indicators by the Bank of Ghana showed a slowdown in the growth of monetary aggregates. A quick look on the Bank of Ghana website looking at the monetary indicators shows that there's a slowdown in terms of savings when you look at uh, December 2019 to the first quarter of 2020 and this is quite evident. Looking at the figures from 16.1% to 12.7% at the end of the first quarter of 2020, we are here in circle to find out from these market women in the face of COVID-19 how their profit margins are looking like, are they making income and are they saving anything at all? Despite the pandemic, business is not that bad. At least I am able to save a little. While some traders are making some income, others are juggling on what to sell to make ends meet. I have changed my trade due to the pandemic, but I'm still not making any profit. Director of Business Operations at Daylex Finance, Joe Jackson, says the trend in decline in income is likely to continue in the face of COVID-19. People, whole sectors of the economy have been wiped out, from hospitality to entertainment to education. So obviously incomes have dropped. And when incomes drop, savings will also drop because it is when you have an income that you start to save. Ghana country senior partner at Price Waterhouse Coopers, Vish Ashabo, says despite projections on low incomes, monies at the banks currently are safe. For some analysts, they are predicting or projecting that savings would slow down in coming days due to COVID-19. Others are also saying with the measures put in place by the central bank, including maintaining the policy rate at 14.5%, it would limit pressure on consumer spending as loans will be available to them. From Circle, Nanekia Mensa Brampa, TV3. And the rallying of crude oil and petroleum prices on the world market has sent Ghana's ex-refinery prices up by 30% on the average. This has influenced the increases in prices at the local pumps for the first time, uh, for the first pricing window of June. The petroleum price buildup has seen the bust margin increase to 6 pesos from 3 pesos. World market prices of crude oil and finished products are rallying. The city lost some 2% of its value in the previous month to the major trading currencies. Kweku Ajimendria is CEO of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, AOMCs. The factors for this particular window, there are two main factors which is going to make the fuel price increase. The global market, crude oil price is going up. So our BDCs, less fuel price have gone up significantly. In fact, averagely, they are going up by 30%. Between that window and this window, as well for loan, 35 percent. Then, quite recently, a part of the price bid up there, so so a boss margin has been increased from three pesos to six pesos, ostensibly to help our state owned uh, setup so that they can revitalize the depots, which is good for us OMCs as well. That has gone up 100 percent. So, if we take the boss alone, 
and you want to work on the price without taking the S refinery price, that's about 0.77% increase. But if you add the margin, the SRF and the bus margin together and do a price made up, the price will shoot between this window and the last window. The price will, will definitely go up by 40% or more. And that's it for business. Up next is sports with Yao Fosilavi. Right, let's do this story before we take the break. 35-year-old Elizabeth Wusua is a lawyer by day and an S by night. But how is she able to juggle between these two professions? Ajua Dubio Wusu has the rest of the story. Elizabeth lived with her mother with five siblings, including a set of twins. At age 12, she moved to live with her uncle and his family in Accra, where she continued her education from Datsu's complex, then later moved to Infantman Girl Senior High to study home economics. It was there that she made up her mind to pursue nursing. I've actually always wanted to be a nurse. That one is a passion I really wanted to be because I've always seen them in their uniforms. I really liked it and I really wanted to be one one day. And I also had a bit of curiosity. I wanted to know more about law. The addressing to also appealed to me, and then talking about advocacy and all those ones. So having a, something to do with health, caring for others, and then more of human rights to issues also was of interest to me. She had her diploma in nursing from the Kolebu Nursing and Midwifery Training College, after which she went ahead to get a degree in nursing from the Central University College. While practicing as a nurse, she applied to the Gimpa Law School where her journey towards her second career began. I applied to the Gimpa Law Faculty for an LLB. It was a competitive something, a whole lot, but well, I took the challenge. She attributes her success to efforts by her group study mates while at Gimpa and encourages everyone, especially young girls, not to let anything deter them from achieving their dreams. It's a different thing altogether. You go from beginning, they speak, and it's like, I can't actually hear what they are saying. So it was really difficult that I just found myself in some group of people who said they were forming study group. And they just decided to approach me for me to join. And I joined it. And that was my miracle. She explains how she juggles between the two professions. You can't have a social life because the little time I have, I have to sleep. So mostly, um, where I'm doing my privilege, I actually told my senior that I work, so he too, he understands. So mostly by four or five, in order to avoid traffic and all, I leave there, then I get home. So between the hours of five and seven, I have to sleep. That two hours is very important to me. So you call me within that time, I will not pick. She is, however, uncertain about what the future has in store for her. Very inspiring story there. Now, the Ghana Water Company Limited is spilling excess water from the Wager Dam. Officials say this is part of routine measures to safeguard the dam. Water levels in the Wager Dam has risen from 37 feet to 47.9 feet as of yesterday. We have had to do so because um, we have exceeded the maximum operating level for the dam, uh, which is 47 feet. As of this morning, we are at 48.3 and we're still expecting uh, more inflows. So it is only prudent for us to spill. The company has begun a house-to-house -house sensitization to caution settlers and residents on the repercussions of their continuous stay within the buffer zone. The GWCL is also liaison with institutions like National Security and NADMO to support the process to avoid disaster. Communities that are likely to be affected include Tetegu, Oblogu, Pambros Salt, Lower McCarthy Hill, Lower Wager, Bojo Beach, Ada Kope, Chokome, and surrounding communities. I think it's a, a sign of responsibility 
and I don't see why we should be doing anything for them. Besides, it isn't within the mandate of the Ghana Water Company Limited to be compensating those people living along the course um, of the river. It's a natural course of a river, and there are rules and regulations within this country where which debars us for putting up structures there, even at the uh, buffer zone. And people have built in the buffer zone and also in the course of the uh, river. Property owners and inhabitants living in communities downstream and along the buffer zone of the river course are therefore advised to evacuate or take immediate precautionary measures to forestall any eventualities and protect life and property. Now, today is the 41st uh, June 4 anniversary, and as uh, it, it's done usually every year, a uh, forum is held. But this year was done virtually, and uh, former President Jerry John Rawlins spoke. The very ordinary people in Ghana are not unwise about issues and developments in this country. We are, however, as a learned group, communicate with us in the administrative English, English language, language puts, them puts them at a disadvantage and makes, and makes them, them unable to demand, demand accountability and transparency from, from us. Had we, as a people, carried carry along our integrity and spirituality in our culture, the material and immaterial corruption in this country would not have undermined our ability and capabilities to the extent where the authority of truth would have been so badly undermined by the corrupted truth of authority. I picked this up from Sadhguru a few nights ago and I thought how splendid. In other words, the authority of truthfulness should not be undermined by the words or supposed truths of those in positions of power or authority. The morality and authority of truth is godly and divine, and it should always supersede and override the truth of the authority of mortals. Ladies and gentlemen, we, in this little Ghana of ours have so mastered, we've mastered the art of untruth in our books, on our radios, on our televisions, and now through the internet. So much so that historical truths and facts are struggling to be recognized. People are paid so much money, corrupt money, to distort and lie about historical truths and facts. Is it any wonder that the precious lessons we should be learning are invariably lost on us and we end up committing the same blunders over and over? Former President Jerry John Rawlins there. This is still Midday Live from our studios at Adesawi Kanda in Accra. Up next is sports.